today we're going to start a little two-week series uh, on Christmas that we're calling Raw and Unfiltered, The Real Christmas Story. Because there might be some things that uh, about the story you don't know. Let's dig into some things we might not know uh, that might help flesh the story out a little bit and bring it to life and certainly add some depth to it because we can become overly familiar with things. And I want to begin with what you may not have known about Mary and Joseph. And let me start off with Mary. Here is how the biography of Jesus written by Luke introduces her. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Now, believe it or not, that very short little introduction already tells us a lot about Mary that you may not have known. First, we're told that she was a virgin, which is a part of the story most people are familiar with or know about. But second, she was engaged to be married. And there's something you might not know there uh, and the significance of it. Back then, a Jewish betrothal period was much more significant and binding than today's engagement periods. Weddings were actually a three-stage event. First, you were pledged, and that could happen to a girl as young as the age of 12. Uh, usually, the parents of the bridegroom approached the parents of the bride. Then, following that, would come the betrothal what we would think of as an engagement period. But this is an engagement on steroids. While there were no sexual relations during that time between the couple, it um, involved just about everything else. The man could already call her his wife and often did, which is why in Matthew's biography of Jesus, Joseph and Mary are talked about as husband and wife before they were married. Uh, that was appropriate for the day because of the serious nature of the pledge they had made and the betrothal or engagement period they were then in. In fact, the betrothal period could only be broken by a divorce uh, or if one of the two parties died. Uh, and if a woman's fiancé died during the betrothal period, she was legally, formally, culturally considered a widow. The third phase was the actual marriage which happened usually one year after you were betrothed. But it was almost a formality, as the woman could actually begin even living with her husband's family. Again, not sharing the same bed, but living in the home as part of that family. Which brings us to another little bit of information. Mary would have been young, but Joseph was not. They had what we might call a May-December romance. And by our standards, very May, very December. But it was also common for that day. He was probably in his 30s. He could have been in his 40s. And she may have been as young as 13. We can assume that because engagement for a woman usually took place immediately after entering puberty, which means Mary may have just entered her teens, like 13, 14, uh, 15 at the oldest. Whereas men would marry later when they could be a financial provider. But that would not have been, again, uncommon for that day. It also explains why we don't hear anything about Joseph um, once Jesus is an adult. Sometime between the ages of uh, 12 and 30, Joseph apparently died. The last record of Joseph is when Jesus was 12, when Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple. The next scene from the life of Jesus in all four biographical accounts of the life, his life in the Bible is when Jesus is 30 and begins his public ministry. And in all four accounts of Jesus' life, not a word is mentioned of Joseph during that time. When he returns home, when he interacts with Mary, just no, no record of Joseph at all, no mention of Joseph. And on the cross, before his death, Jesus asks John, his cousin, to watch over Mary, which intimates that Jesus, as the eldest son, had carried that responsibility to that point and now asks another to watch over his mother, which tells us, again, Mary was a widow, and that sometime between the ages of Jesus being 12 and 30, probably in his teen years, Joseph had died. There's an old tradition, not in the Bible, just an old tradition, that says that Joseph lived until he was 111 years old, dying when Jesus was 18. That he had been married with children before Mary, but his first wife had died, which would have made him a very elderly man when he was betrothed to Mary, maybe around 92 years of age. But regardless of exactly when he died or what filled his life before his, this marriage, 
Uh, his death explains why Jesus didn't begin his public ministry until the age of around 30. Jesus was providing for the family. He was providing for Mary. He was doing what a son was supposed to do and needed to do. He was carrying on with his father's trade as taught by his father. And yes, you're probably thinking, oh yeah, he was a carpenter and a carpenter's son. Actually, another little tidbit, even though we're not chasing this kind of stuff, uh, you know, what you didn't know about Jesus as an adult, but um, the Greek word for carpenter actually was just, he was a builder. I mean, that's, that's kind of what it meant. He built things. He was a, like a construction worker or a house builder. And uh, he would have worked with wood, but the most common element for that area would have been stone. So he was probably mostly some type of stonemason. But he assumed the role of caregiver until his brothers were able to assume primary care for their mother and other siblings. But not only was Joseph older and Mary young, they were also very poor. And I do mean very poor. We know this from a scene that took place on the 40th day after the birth of Jesus when they took Jesus to Jerusalem. Let me read what happened. Then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses, after the birth of child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Okay, here's what was going on. Following the birth of a son, a mother had to wait 40 days before going to the temple to offer a sacrifice for the purpose of purification. If she had a girl, that time was doubled. The purpose was to consecrate the baby to God. This wasn't baptism. It was more like an infant dedication when the parents commit themselves to raising their child in the context of their faith and their values. Back then, it was usually just the firstborn that was dedicated in this way because it was the firstborn that had all the rights of inheritance. Now, as part of that dedication, it was common and expected to give a sacrifice or an offering to God. We're told here that what they offered, according to the law of Moses, was a pair of doves or a pair of pigeons. That's how we know they were very poor. The best sacrifice, the most common sacrifice, the sacrifice that most would have made would have been a lamb. Uh, and you were only allowed to bring something else if you didn't have the money for a lamb. And to give that lesser offering, you had to get special temple approval, a recognition that you really were so poor you couldn't afford anything else for that pair of doves or pigeon to be accepted. So they were a bit of a May-December couple. They were poor. And then we're told that Mary was from the city of Nazareth. That means something, too. Though Joseph was from the line of David and his hometown was Bethlehem, which was why they had to journey there before uh, the birth of Jesus for the census, because the way a census was taken back then was that you registered in your hometown, they were living in Nazareth, which was where Mary was from. Now, while Nazareth is well known to us now, it was obscure back then. I mean, it wasn't a big, you know, town. It was not a large place. Think of it as a small village. And those who did know about it didn't think too highly of it. It had a reputation, um, and it wasn't a good one. For comparison, if you were to Google the worst cities to visit in the United States due to high crime rates, poverty, and unemployment, you would get, because I did it this week, you would get cities like St. Louis, Stockton, Oakland, Cleveland. But leading the list is Detroit which is considered the most dangerous city in the U.S., as well as being made up of the rudest people in the U.S. Think of Nazareth as kind of like a small version of the Detroit of its day. Later on in the Bible's record of the life of Jesus, we actually read that when people heard of Jesus of Nazareth, because that's how they identified with people back then, you would say their first name and where they were from. So you would read many times in the Bible, Jesus of Nazareth, because that's just the way they talked back then. It was something of a hurdle to get past. In fact, the word Nazarene in that day was synonymous with someone who was despised. Uh, here's a taste of that dynamic from when Jesus first began his public ministry. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida. Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, 
We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. Well, finally and most importantly, something you don't want to miss in this story, but it often is, is how Joseph and Mary both had and were faced with a defining moment that we tend to gloss over and we don't realize how significant this moment was and their decisions were. We take it too casually in, in stride in regard to the story. Let me tell you what I mean by a defining moment. There are certain things that we can do within the course of our lives that transcend time itself in such a way that what we do with that moment uh, carries enormous impact uh, or carries enormous significance for us and our life or in the lives of other people. And it often comes at great personal risk or challenge. Let me, let me chase that a bit more because it's uh, increasingly a lost understanding, so much so that we don't even have the language for it. We talk about time as a singular kind of monolithic time. The ancients did not. In fact, because of their belief in the importance of the idea of a defining moment or defining moments in a life, uh, the ancient Greeks had two words for time. One was chronos, where we get our word chronological, and this refers to calendar time, days, weeks, months, years, what we usually think of when we use the word time. But then they had a second word for time, kairos, a word that meant something different, something deeper. In fact, so different that we don't even have an English equivalent for it. So what is kairos about? Kairos has to do with the quality of time. It's time filled with opportunity. It's a moment pregnant with eternal significance and possibility. It's a moment when we are confronted with a choice or decision or potential action that holds the deepest level of significance for who we are, who we are becoming, and what our life impact will be. You find this idea of kairos moments all through the Bible. For example, the prophet Jeremiah talked about the life of the great Pharaoh of Egypt as not being so great. And this is reason why. He says, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is only a loud noise. He has missed his opportunity, in the word kairos. Now that's fascinating. Here was a man who led a nation, a leader with armies at his command. And what was the opportunity he missed? What possible event could have escaped his grasp? A kairos moment. And because of that, He's no more than a footnote in history. Another example, you can turn to the New Testament. There's this scene where uh, toward the end of Jesus' life when he comes to the city of Jerusalem and he comes to this ridge overlooking the city. And the Bible says that when he comes over to this ridge and looks down at the city from that height, he just breaks down and begins weeping. And this was a city that was the center of its world. Uh, Jerusalem was the home of the temple, the focus of commerce, the place where people longed their whole life to travel to. Yet when Jesus saw it and the people in it, he felt nothing but sorrow for them, pity for them, grief for them. Uh, why? Let me read it. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but you did not recognize the time, the kairos, of God's coming to you. Do, you. do you see the power and the depth of these moments? I, I really appreciate how Oz Guinness described it. Let me just read his description. He says, nothing is more critical than to recognize and respond to such a moment. Before will hardens into fate and choice into might have been, the kairos hour is the moment when the present is at its greatest intensity and the future is uniquely open to our decision and action. Which is why the Bible teaches us the following life truth. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. And the word there is again, kairos. And as I've studied this, these moments are almost always character-based. Uh, they speak to issues of virtue. They have to do with choosing between right and wrong, overcoming temptation, responding when God taps you on the shoulder of your heart with personal conviction. They, they deal with courage and fortitude, trust and faith. 
it, it, it's these are moments where God directly asks us to do something and the choice is, are we going to obey or not? And it shapes the deepest part of who we are and who God is calling us to be. And they often, again, come in the form of a decision, a choice. And this is what marked Mary and Joseph more than anything. We know what they chose, but do we know the depth of what a Kairos moment it was for them? Uh, this is what most people miss about the Christmas story. I mean, first, let's think about Mary. An angel comes and tells her that she has found favor with God, that she's going to have a baby conceived by the Holy Spirit, a son, and she's to give him the name Jesus. Okay, that wasn't the defining moment. The defining moment was her reply. Let me read it. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Now think about that reply, that response in light of her situation. She lived in a small town. Uh, there would be scandal. Uh, she'd have to tell her parents. She was going to have to tell Joseph. Who could possibly believe this? An angel, oh, right, you know, came to you. And this is by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Joseph knew he hadn't slept with her. So who had she been sleeping with? I mean, what kind of girl was this? And legally, he could divorce her. Uh, that's not all. In that day and time, the penalty for adultery was death, death by stoning. So she knew when she's, uh, that she'd have to endure scandal, probably divorce and possibly death. So keep that in mind when you hear the words, may it be to me as you have said. She could have said no. She could have said, find someone else. I mean, <clears throat> anyone else, this is too much. But this little teenaged girl said, yes. Now think of Joseph. The Bible tells us in a detail found in Matthew's account of the story that Joseph was going to divorce her quietly when she told him the news. And that tells you something about him. Based on his Jewish faith, and he was a very pious man, he only had two options. To be considered righteous, he couldn't marry her. That was not an option. He couldn't marry her because that would be considered uh, an affirmation of her adultery. According to the law, he could only do one of two things. He could divorce her publicly, making the reasons known, and obviously put her to shame, and possibly even it would lead to her being put to death. The positives would be it would allow him to do the right thing by himself and also make himself look good. But it marries expense. Or he could divorce her quietly. That was the second option, so that no one would know the reason, uh, possibly even sending her away. This would allow him to do the right thing personally, and it would also be the best he could do for Mary if he had any sympathy toward her at all. But it came at some personal risk to himself, or at least his reputation, because he would be seen as someone who was stood up by his bride as the marriage approached. So it would mean public humiliation for him. He chose the humiliation and was going to pursue a quiet divorce. But then he had a visit from an angel, and the angel told him, it's all true. This is a God thing. You should take Mary as your bride. Um, and now Joseph also had a choice, and he made it. He accepted the baby with faith, just like Mary. He remained betrothed to her. He even went a step further and immediately took her home as his wife and then did everything he could to care for her including taking her with him to Bethlehem for the census. Now, here's why that should stand out. He didn't have to take Mary to Bethlehem for the census, not legally. Women, even wives, weren't required to go. But he took her with him. Now, why would he do that? Well, first, it would seem that he wanted to be there for the birth of Jesus. I mean, to celebrate that birth, to be a part of it, to be there for Mary, to stand with her through every leg of the journey. But second, it was another way of saving her from any potential embarrassment or ridicule from those who would not believe the truth of her situation. You see, the, the movies and, and TV shows make it seem like they went to Bethlehem in her ninth month, and she was in heavy labor on the donkey, uh, got there just in time to give birth, and then left right after. Bible never says that. Let me read to you what the Bible does say. At that time, the Roman emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. 
He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. Okay, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. We don't know how long they were there. We don't know how long in advance of Jesus' birth Joseph left to go. What probably happened is that they went just before her third trimester, before she would really start to show, and Joseph took her with him, and at that time, because he didn't want her enduring the ridicule of being seen as someone who somehow got pregnant outside of marriage. Because people do the math. They did the math then, they do the math now. I mean, they think, okay, Mary and Joseph were betrothed. No sexual relations are to take place between betrothal and marriage. Well, she went away for three months to her cousin Elizabeth's, which is, by the way, is what she did after the angel came to her with the news. She comes home. That's when she gathers up the courage to tell Joseph the news. And then everybody knows that she and Joseph immediately go to the second stage and get married. No invitation, no caterer, no wedding singer, no registry. And then three months later, she starts to show. And then three months after that, there's a baby. Okay, people can add and subtract. Joseph wants to protect her. So they probably went early, stayed in a crowded room in the home of some poor relative until the birth of the baby necessitated their vacating it for privacy and more space. And it was then, as they sought a place at the inn, any inn, that they found there was nowhere for them to go. So there you have it. Maybe a little bit about the story of Joseph and Mary that you didn't know, but hopefully more than just some interesting trivia. But the, the way their life challenges ours, um, something for us that we didn't think it was there. And here's how I kind of play it in my own head. How would I handle a Kairos moment given to me like it was given to Joseph and Mary? A choice, a decision that meant everything, but could potentially cost me everything. Or even more to the point, and I say this to me and you, how will you handle the Kairos moment that God will bring to bear on your life that's rooted in doing something or acting a certain way, that it's deeply character-based and driven solely by obedience to his moral will. You might be wrestling with one right now. You know exactly what it is God is calling you to do, and you don't want to do it. Or you're, you're, and, and, and you're kind of in the balance. Well, let me tell you how that's going to play out. It, you'll make a decision based on whether you engage it the way Joseph and Mary did. It's going to depend because no matter what the Kairos moment might be, no matter the cost that might be attached to it, your response is going to be based on whether you look at this through the eyes of reason or through the eyes of revelation. When you make a decision based on reason, you look at what you have, you do some calculations and figure out what's reasonable, affordable, most advantageous, and then that's your choice. It's really you just make out a T-chart of the pros and the cons, the benefits and the costs, and you go with the one that seems to promise the biggest payoff or carries the least negatives. There's really not faith that's involved at all because you really haven't brought God into it at all. And it has one overriding value. Uh, my goal is to not sacrifice, to not have less, to not have anything you know averse come to me uh, unless the, the sacrifice is something I intentionally do as an investment in an even larger payoff. Everything is about what serves you. It really is a T-chart. Pros and cons, benefits. That's doing life by reason. Well, there's a lot of life that that's an appropriate way to do it. But there's also Kairos moments where you shouldn't do it by reason. You need to do it by revelation. You don't go with what the town is going to say about your pregnancy. You go with what the angel told you it's all about. When you do something by revelation, you go to God in prayer and you say, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, what do you want me to give? How do you want me to serve? Where do you want me to go? Uh, whatever it is, I'll do it. Now, that's not a T-chart. That's a bungee jump. Um, because the only reason you would do it is because you're trusting in something other than yourself. Uh, that's what faith is. Confidence and trust in God. But not just any kind of confidence or trust in God. It's a confidence and trust based on your belief in him and his ability and character as opposed to circumstances. 
And if reason is based on the idea that maybe nothing is worth sacrificing for, revelation is based on the idea that you don't have to have a good life at all. You don't have to even live. Uh, the ultimate goal of life is, is, is not really to survive. It's to be faithful. Did you catch that with Mary, with Joseph? They didn't feel like they had to survive. That wasn't the overarching principle. There was no sense of self-protection going on. I don't mean they were reckless or pursued risks and thrills for their own sake. I mean that when you look at their life, you find that they followed God's leadership with complete abandon. They went through life knowing that they didn't have to preserve their life. They just had to live it in faith and trust and obedience and submission. They knew that their life was not meant to be cultivated, but spent. And when that's what's operating, everything changes. So again, where right now are you operating on reason? God's calling you to operate on revelation. Is it a career decision? Is it a financial decision? Is it a decision about a relationship? Uh, where is God giving you the chance to say, May it be to me as you have said. Well, whatever it is, don't miss or squander a Kairos moment.